um, to share that with them. I'm going to be working with um, Click Meeting to try to make that available, um, you know, for free. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, my name is Levada Berger. I'm the Deputy Director with the Right Question Institute. I'm really excited to be here with you today sharing the strategy. This is the first series of webinars that we've started. Um, so this one here will just be an introduction. We'll be together for just about 30 minutes or so. Um, and then we may either go through another one based on what you guys share, which would work well and what didn't work and kind of think about how to improve it. Um, but we will also in the future have webinars that go a little bit deeper into the strategy and focus on the question focus, for example, how to create a, an effective question focus and other pieces of the strategy as well. But today will be a pretty quick um, introduction to the strategy. Want to be sure, right, even though it's a webinar and obviously can't see you and um, um, we're not actually in the same room, it would be great to be communicating throughout the webinar. So if you're on Facebook, please do tweet at us at, at right question. Um, you can also use the chat feature here. I really encourage you to do that. I'll be looking at it as we're going throughout sessions. So if you have questions, thoughts, or reflections, please feel free to share them there. So the plan for the web, we're going to start off just going into the big picture about question formulation and why that's a key skill um, that's important for each of us to develop. Then we're going to go into an actual experience in the process. So this we're going to do as individuals. Um, I'm actually going to ask that you guys get a piece of paper or a pen ready um, or pull up a Word doc that you can actually go through the strategy to get using. And this one is fine if you go through it as individuals. In most cases in the classroom is done in the group, but really want to give you the opportunity to go through that just so you can experience it. Then we're going to go and look at the strategy a bit more to really think about what's behind the strategy um, and why does this actually make a difference. And we're going to finish off just with some words really reflecting on the bigger picture and how this is relevant um, even beyond the classroom. So again, as we're going through, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat area. I will be looking at that. Um, or you, I think you can actually say if you want to raise your hand um, and then we can actually go through if you would like to um, actually share your question aloud. Great, I see. So Drew, and I'm not sure, are you referring to people here who are actually participating? He's interested in knowing how many people are teachers, admin, or consultants. I'm um, in a general sense, um, most of the people that we work with, the largest chunk are um, administrators. So we tend to partner with school districts or organizations around the country. And then we'll go in and provide a training to their entire group um, of teachers. So, yep, so I see you guys. You can share if you're a teacher or a consultant or a parent. That's awesome. And parents often use the strategy, you know, even with their kids or when they're homeschooling or anything like that. Great, right, so a lot of teachers today, tonight. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in in the interest of time. Um, the question formulation technique, or more so the broader right question strategy, really started um, from work with low-income parents in 1990 in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And our co-founders, Dan and Luz, heard over and over again from the families they were working with that, oh, we don't go to the school because we don't even know what to ask. We don't feel comfortable there. It's not a welcoming place. So they, you know, came up with a brilliant idea and they decided to give the parents, give the families questions each time a different situation would come up. So if a parent was going to the school to work with their child because they just received the IEP, Dan and Lewis would come up with questions that they could use. If they needed to go to the school, I'm um, just to talk about report cards, Dan and Lewis would come up with questions. And they realized that they were creating dependency. And that was not at all the goal, right? They also learned from parents that they were most effective when they focused their questions on decisions. So they developed um, two frameworks. One is the question formulation technique, which we're going to dive into today. And the other is the called the framework for accountable decision making. I um, mean, that work right now really happens in a lot of different sectors, including healthcare, in terms of patients really. Um, advocating for themselves and being partners in their healthcare 
I'm in family engagement, really tied to the roots of the organization and providing strategies for parents to be partners in their children's education and to really play a role at the school building. I'm in innovation with organizations such as Microsoft and a few others. And that work, that work really sparked when RQI was featured in the book, A More Beautiful Question, is really centered around the idea of what does it take to be an innovator, a change maker, I'm a creator in this world. So the work in education really started um, just a few years ago, maybe around 2010. Yeah, at that time, there was a small group of teachers actually using the strategy in their classroom and Harvard Education Press um, approached the co-founders here and said, we really want to share this strategy with more educators. Would you write a book and include the strategy in there? And since then, educators all around the world have been using the strategy including potentially many of you. Um, so when we think about why questions are important, just beyond the fact that when you ask your own question, you're more curious and more likely to kind of seek that information and, and just kind of eat it up. We There was a survey of college presidents a few years back and with the, the findings kind of came to the conclusion that questions were important. But the interesting thing was that two college presidents in particular, really noted that by the time students graduate from college, they should know how to frame a question, how to ask their own questions, and how to figure out which questions are the right questions. Our standpoint is that we agree with that, right? We think that that would be awesome, but we also think that we need to start building that skill from a very, very young age, you know, and it doesn't necessarily take um, $200,000 in debt to really go through and develop that skill set. So take a, take a look at this, right? This is something I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And it's just the idea that I'm in, this is, a, this is focused on the United States of this um, chart here, but that most students, um, most of our population reach the basic skill level, right? So this isn't talking about high level skills, just the basic skill level in reading and writing by the time they're 18. Now take a look at this next slide. When what you may notice here is that right once students get to the school age of around four, five, six, the number of questions that they ask start to dramatically decline. Right? We know this happens for many reasons. Um, when you're a little kid, you want to know, you know, why is the sky blue? Is there a God? Different questions like that. And as you start to get older, you may start to feel like you have answers to those questions. But we also know that even when students have questions, they have their wondering or they have things they don't know they are less likely to actually ask those questions um, in the classroom setting. So what we've been working on is really thinking about how do you kind of codify this strategy in a way that's simple, teachers can learn it one day and use it the next day, and that really gets at this big idea, that students are more successful when they learn to ask their own questions, right? That's in the classroom, that's as they're navigating college, as they're navigating any sort of process, if they're asking their own questions and seeking that information, they are much more likely to be successful. And just to share a quick quote um, with you, this the, the bottom one is from a ninth grade remedial summer school student out in Boston. And he shared with us that the way that after he used the strategy, it made him feel smart because he was asking good questions and giving good answers. Right. So if you just imagine for yourself, put yourself in that student's feet, footsteps, shoes rather. <laughs> Just what that feeling really means, right, as a student who at this time was in summer school, um, was on the path to kind of staying back potentially, but actually had an opportunity to experience a process that made him feel smart and feel like he was engaged in starting to um, ask good questions. And another student just sort of commented that when you're the one asking the question, you feel like it's your job to get the answer. So um, quickly, we're about to get ready to jump into the process, but just to share a little bit, the question formulation technique um, is a step-by-step -step process. I'm gonna show you the steps after we go through the process, but it's really focused on students or other individuals producing their own questions, improving their questions, and strategizing on, on actually how to use their questions. I love the conversation going on down there. Um, so let's get ready to jump into actually using the strategy. Make sure you have a pen and a paper ready to go or that you just have a Word doc open that you can go through as we're um, going through the steps. So I'll give you about 30 seconds just to go gather those materials if you want to do that now.
Great, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first part of the question formulation technique is the rules for producing questions. So there are four rules. Um, you can take a moment and read them over. Really want to point out, even as you're doing it as an individual, um, when you get to do not stop to answer, judge, or discuss, that still applies, right? Don't and don't respond to any of your questions. Um, don't judge any of your questions. So as they come to your mind, write them down exactly as they're coming. Um, if you want to change it, that's now a new question. So make sure you're getting that down. What would be, and feel free to respond in the chat area, which of these rules would be most difficult for you to follow? Which of these rules would be most difficult for you to follow? Right, and I'm seeing a lot of people sort of saying rule number two, do not stop to answer, judge, or discuss. And a lot of time, right, that is one of the more difficult rules because we're kind of in this mode of responding to questions or saying, oh, that was a good question, or just like, uh, you know, or what if we reword it this way? Um, so that is a really important rule to make sure that you're not judging any of the questions, even your own questions. And then when we think about um, when you're the recorder, right, so that is a case, especially if there are a lot of questions happening, the challenge can be in writing a question exactly as it stated. The challenge can also be in asking as many questions as you can, right? So that's one other thing to, um, to keep in mind. And they're not always individually recorded, right? So if you're doing it in the group format, um, usually you'll choose one recorder for that group and they'll actually write down everyone's questions. In some cases, if it's done using technology, they're typing the questions or different things like that. But when you do it as a group, you are usually recording um, each of the individual questions together. So let's go ahead and jump into the process. Um, the first part of the process is what we call a question focus. And it's really just a prompt that either the teacher or whoever is facilitating that day uses to solicit questions. So the question focus we're going to be working with tonight is some students are not asking questions. So again, the question focus is some students are not asking questions. I want you to take about three minutes individually, or if you're sitting next to someone, that's fine as well. Um, and just actually go through and ask as many questions as you can, making sure to follow the other rules and make sure to number your questions as you go. Three minutes, you're writing questions about some students are not asking questions. About 30 more seconds.
Okay, so let's keep moving. Um, so now that you've had an opportunity to actually produce your questions, we're at, now we're going to go to the next step in the process, which is categorizing your question. At this stage, we focus on close and open-ended questions, and we use the simple definition that close-ended questions can be answered with yes, no, or one word response, and open-ended questions require um, more explanation. Usually when those you ask a question at can be replied to with a list of pieces of information, we include that as a closed-ended question as well. So now I'm going to give you about a minute to go through and label each of your questions as closed or open. I'll mark the closed questions with a C and mark the open questions with an O. About one minute for that. So now let's come back together and actually chat for a bit and literally put chats in the chat box. What are some of the advantages of closed-ended questions? What are some advantages of closed-ended questions? So you get faster answers. They're easier to answer. Um, quick answer to simple problems. Easy and quick answers. What are some of the disadvantages of closed-ended questions? What are some of the disadvantages of closed-ended questions? Often definitive, can clarify the boundaries of the topic. Mm, do not promote thinking in some little depth. They can, can be biased, do not encourage discussion, limited understanding. What about open-ended questions? What are some advantages of open-ended questions? Create depth can lead to more questions, make brains work, may have more than one answer, promote critical thinking, um, promote intellectual reflection, wondering, explanation can open possibilities. What about disadvantages? What about disadvantages of open-ended questions? Go off on tangents, off topic, too much time, or they can go, go off left field, get off topic, overwhelm learners. You might not reach your learning goal, says the chemistry teacher. <laughs> Could be random. So I actually want you to go through and um, improve your questions, right? So take a look at your questions and think about which of them could be improved from changing one closed-ended question into an open question and from changing one open-ended question into a closed-ended question. So take a moment, choose one question, one question, that question, that question, that's closed the question, and close it down. About one minute for that. So now we're going to move to the next step, and we're going a bit faster than you would if you were facilitating just in, in terms of timing and because you're doing it as individuals um, versus in the classroom, in most cases, you would be doing it in groups. 
Um, so now let's go through and take a look at your questions and prioritize your questions. So choose three questions that you would consider um, most important. And when you're prioritizing, think about your question focus. Some students are not asking questions. About one minute for this. Um, one thing to point out, just in sort of reflecting on closed and open-ended questions, you all pointed out advantages and disadvantages of each, and we really just emphasize that both closed-ended and open-ended questions are important and valuable. So there are some situations we would be working with low-income families, and they would tell us things like, you know, when you go to the welfare office, it's really important for you to be able to ask very sharp closing the questions so that you can get the specific information that you need. But in other situations, it's really important to be able to identify those open-ended questions um, that, that really open up the explanation. So it's really just emphasizing that both types of questions are important and are valuable for learners and for us um, as adults as well. So now I just want to take a moment and just hear, um, again, if comfortable, share in the chat. What did you learn so far? Right, so that's the the process pretty much in a nutshell. What did you learn so far? And I see some thoughts coming up and want to give you some time just to reflect on that as you're going through the process. Like, what are you learning as we're going through this um, together? Thank you. So let's go to let go through and actually unpack um, the question formulation technique. So these are the different components. Thank you, Beth and Diane. Thank you, Linda. These are the different components of the question formulation technique. Um, the question focus, then you go through produce your questions, improve your questions, prioritize them, discuss next steps, and reflect. As a teacher or a facilitator, right, whatever, whatever role you have, there are a few things you plan before you actually go into the, the classroom or into the meeting. You come prepared with the question focus, right, and that's linked to your teaching goals for that particular session. You come prepared with the instructions to prioritize the question. So we use the basic instructions that choose the three questions that are most important. But you can actually change that up, right? You could say choose the choose one question to write your research paper on, or choose three testable questions, et cetera. There are a lot of different ways you can do that. You can overlay Bloom's taxonomy, right? And, and say choose three questions that fit in certain categories. Um, and you also come prepared with the next step. So you already know how you're going to have students or your staff members participate in, what you're going to have them do with the next steps. And I see that in there. Right? So I see um, Drew and a few others making note about reflection. Reflection is exactly where the learning happens, right? So it's really important that we don't skip that step and that we have students actually go through um, and talk about what they learn going through the process um, and what they're taking from it. The biggest change here is really just the fact that you're giving students an opportunity to ask their own question. This is not to say that teachers or administrators would never ask another question. That would just be silly. This is really about students having that space and that opportunity to really start to build their question ask skills so that they're actually asking questions um, in your classroom and beyond, right beyond those sessions when you're using the question formulation technique. Behind the process, there are three key thinking abilities. And I saw some of this come up as you guys were sharing um, different responses. The first one is this divergent thinking. And that really starts to happen when students are producing their own questions um, because they are going in many different directions, but centered on that question focus that you created. 
right? But as students start to share their questions, they're listening to each other and they're getting ideas for um, other questions that they could ask. And the other is convergent thinking. And convergent thinking really happens um, when students are starting to prioritize, when they're starting to really narrow down the questions that they have. And the third is metacognition, right? So this is really, this really starts to happen. Um, it happens throughout the process, but when I asked you what rule would be difficult for you to follow, right? So you're thinking about your thinking. When um, you go to that reflection piece, again, you're thinking about your thinking. Um, even in the prioritization, there's a, a step that we didn't really go through, or not a step, but a part of that step where you talk about your rationale for choosing those questions as priority questions. Um, so now I want to share a few examples with you, just so you can get a sense of what this looks like um, in classrooms from early education to the higher grades. The first example I'm going to share comes from a kindergarten class in Maryland. Um, the teacher there really wanted to use it as a pre-reading text, a pre-reading hook, um, just thinking about the focus on information text and Common Core and other pieces like that. So take a look at this question focus and think about what questions come to your mind. Take a look at this question focus. What questions come to your mind? Just think about it. So now take a look at some of the questions that students came up with. And these are kindergarten students um, and they did it as a whole group. So the teacher was the recorder. And some questions include, is the alligator camouflaged? Is it a mom or dad crocodile? Um, where are they going? Why are the baby alligator's eyes white and the mom's black? All right, so you can start to get a sense of um, the understanding of things that students are paying attention to, that level of detail. You can also start to get a sense of misconceptions that they may have. Some of them think it's a crocodile. Some of them are saying alligator. So really get an opportunity to um, discuss their questions. The next example I'm going to show is from middle school. I um, mean, it's from a social studies classroom. Uh, this teacher also used um, a photo, and it was before students were actually going to go in and read. This photo is of uh, the, the Canaan of Sumner. So again, just take, you know, 10, 15 seconds. What questions come to your mind? And these are some of the questions that students ask. Um, why are they fighting? Are they a part of the government? Were they signing anything? Um, why didn't they call 911? Um, was this related to slavery? Who hit who first? And um, why are they smiling? So if you take a look at the background here, you can see some people in the background sort of laughing and smiling at the situation. So the students are really paying attention to that detail, but they're also trying to make connection to um, previous work that they learned about in this course and really get at some of the key issues, right? And then there are a lot of questions that are just questions that would probably be the forefront of a middle schooler's mind, right? Like who hit who first? How did this all go down? Um, the last example I'm going to show today comes from a math classroom, a high school um, math classroom, and this was really centered on a slightly different purpose. The teacher wanted students to get the sense that mathematics almost similar to science, right, is, is a problem-solving um, field. And they, when they approach it, they should be approaching it as a problem-solving tool that they can use. So he actually used a question focus, equation equals balance. Take a moment, think of some questions. These are some of the questions. This is from one of the groups. Um, they asked, <laughs> oh, the last question always is hilarious to me, will we ever see this in the future? Right. So students often want to know, like, how does this, what we're learning in this class, relate to broader topics? They also ask questions like, does it have to be an equation? How do you get an equation to balance? What exactly is balance? Right. So that conceptual understanding that they're looking for comes out there. As you'll see, um, there are a lot of different ways that educators use the strategy. Some of them are using it for projects, independent work, um, to analyze problems, to start to kind of get questions for Socratic seminars, right? There are a ton of different reasons 
that educators decide to use the strategy. I'm going to share with you now, just a really quick, like this is um, really, really quick, very, a, a video of the strategy in practice. Today we'll be doing the question formulation technique. I'm not going to be doing Today any we'll of the generating questions question that all that technique. work is on them. I'm not going to be it doing any of the generating that questions that process, all that them work is on them. Wow, it continues that, that, that creative process and it no makes them realize, wow, the they all have the something to contribute. They it's no group asks the, the same question. You see the transformation. They take ownership of the questions that they created more than the ones that I created for them. Because it's like, look, you guys have just done this really hard work. You've just generated your own questions. And typically that's my role as a teacher, right? Right? And so I think that public recognition is really no important for students no matter to feel proud and how small that is, whether it's a closed question, open question. No question, no matter how small that is, whether it's a closed question, open question, it's really not a dumb question. Like, that's really my main thing. Give me a scenario where you think you need to ask a question in life. Give me a scenario where you think you need to ask a question in life. Great. So um, one thing, again, that was just like a very short version. There's a longer version on the website. If you're already a network member, you can easily access it on the research resources page. If you're not already a member, you can easily join. It's free um, and get the full or a, a longer version of that um, session. So just start to wrap up. Just wanted to share, you know, the bigger idea. I'll definitely um, send the link as well. It's really about getting students not only to ask their own questions and to get to better answers and to be more engaged in ownership, but it's really to get them to be driving their education, right? Driving what they're learning in the classroom to really spark um, their, their desire to be a learner and really spark that curiosity and inquiry in them. But it's also right, the joy in it. When people are working together in groups, there's just fun um, and there's fun in learning for the students and for the teachers. But even goes um, beyond that, and it connects to democracy, right? This idea that we need to be taught to study rather than to believe and to inquire rather than to affirm. So as an educator, you have a very unique position because you are in the place to really spark that desire to study, that, in, that desire to inquire rather than just be recipients of information. You really have that um, unique role. This, this is a, actually a photo of Ms. Clark who was doing this work in the South, work with African-Americans um, illiterate African Americans and really pushing them um, to inquire about the world and really be learners, especially during a time when they didn't have access to educational resources. So I wanted to share again, um, these are free resources on the network. You go to the website, you click on Educator Network, you go to resources, the video is there, as well as um, other free resources such as PowerPoints and things you can use in your classroom. And I see some folks already about it. We do have the summer conference coming up on July 13th and 14th um, of this year. And the fees are there. There are a limited number of partial scholarships available um, for educators working in low-income school districts and for educators of color. If you're interested, please just email me um, after this and I'll be in touch with you pretty soon. I um, would love to actually get each of you to fill out a quick poll. It would be really helpful um, just as we're thinking about webinars in the future and making sure that we're providing the best um, resource information that we could. This is the first time, so you and the group before you were really um, guinea pigs in some ways, so really looking to get your information and to figure out how, what we can do to improve the webinars. So again, thank you so much for your time. Feel free to email me, to post any questions in the chat, or to tweet at us. And I'll be responding to them um, in the next, probably in the next day or so. I'll leave the group open for um, the next five minutes, just so that you can actually ask any questions you have um, and complete.